Today we have podcast host Sarah Stewart Holland and Beth Silvers from Kentucky as part of a series of events funded by a grant from the Center for the Study of Institutions and Innovation. The Civil Liberties Committee strives to help students become more aware of the world around them. In our eyes, a liberal arts education does not just mean becoming a well-rounded, educated person, but a person who will contribute to society. This being an election year, it is all the more important to be cognizant of our political system. Let's meet our guests. Sarah Stewart Holland has always loved politics, although her political opinions have changed drastically over the years. She worked in politics and on Capitol Hill before moving back to her hometown of Paducah, Kentucky, where she currently serves on the Paducah City Commission. She's happily married and the mother of three sons. Sarah likes her bourbon on ice, her romantic dramas with a British accent, and her iPhone fully charged. <laughs> Beth Silvers owns and operates Checking In with Beth Silvers, a life and business coaching practice. She's been recognized as one of Ohio's most powerful and influential women by the Ohio Diversity Council, a human resources game changer by Workforce Magazine, and one of Cincinnati's 40 under 40 business leaders. Beth lives in Union, Kentucky with her husband, Chad, daughters, Jane and Ellen, and miniature schnauzer, Lucy. She loves people, politics, poetry, and watermelon. Now let's give a warm Wisconsin welcome to Beth and Sarah. Welcome everyone. So earlier today we talked about how there's such a thing as an unbiased source, and that bias doesn't necessarily mean it's fake. So in the spirit of transparency about biasness, is that a word? Sure. Um, I hate the Electoral College, so let's just get that out of the way. Doesn't mean we don't have facts up here. It was going to become pretty quickly apparent to you that I hate the Electoral College, but I thought I would just be up front about it. Okay, that's a way to start. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we're glad that y'all joined us. I know this is a tough topic, but I think it's very relevant. It's going to get even more relevant. So you can kick us to the next slide. We thought we'd give you a little bit of background um, about where the Electoral College came from and then talk some about what its pros and cons are. It sounds like I will be doing the lifting on the pros. Yep. Um, and then we'll talk about some alternatives. What could we do if we didn't do this? And we'd love to have some time where we're in conversation with you. That's always our favorite part of doing live events. We talk to each other constantly. It's a lot more fun to talk to y'all in a setting like this. So just warning you, we're gonna put you on the spot and hope for great questions, okay? All right. So where did we get this idea of the Electoral College? You can go to the next slide because there's a quick reveal here. Yeah, we made it up. Um, it's like a totally new system. We were making up this whole democracy, republic situation, and so they made it up. That's the, that's the very, um, I hope there's not like a history professor in the crowd, because that's a really quick, easy version of what happened, is the founding fathers were like, what could we do? Let's make it up. So, a little bit of expansion on that. <laughs> Um, and you can kind of click. Yeah, click one and get a picture of the film. See, look, there they are, making yeah. it up. And then you can keep going. Um, so we were founded on this idea of being a republic, right? And that was very important to the founding fathers that yes, we are a nation, but we are a nation of states. And we are a nation of states that have control over their own destinies. But this quickly led to some competition among the states, as you can imagine that it might. And the northern states in the Union had more potential voters in those states. Southern states were like 40 to 60% enslaved people who the founding fathers had not seen fit to allow to vote. And so we had this terrible situation of disenfranchising people from the beginning in our nation um, and competition among the states thinking about influence and the southern states particularly concerned that the northern states were they able to control elections because they were more populous, just going right ahead and abolishing slavery, um, and in their minds, thus destroying the economy of the southern states. 
Yeah, I think it's interesting. I think we talk about United States history as if the conflict between northern and southern states began with the Civil War. Not the case. That was one long brewing conflict. And you see all the roots of that conflict in the discussion the Founding Fathers, disagreements, arguments, fights, um, had during the Constitutional Convention, which was, again, a redo because they did the Articles of Confederation and they were a disaster. So they, when they sat down to do the Constitutional Convention and were trying to think through these compromises, you know, I also feel like we often talk about the Founding Fathers as a unit, as if they all agreed, which they obviously did not. We've all seen Hamilton now. That is not the first Hamilton reference I will make tonight, just so you have a bingo card. Um, and then also, as not just that they were agreement, but that there was some um, superhuman moral clarity. But you see with this three-fifths compromise and all their conversations about slavery that they were conflicted. They saw the inherent hypocrisy of talking about a republic and talking about equality while enslaving people. It's not like they were blind to it. And, I mean, this three-fifths compromise, as was often the case, um, I think you see the power of southern states because it was a compromise, but it put enormous power in the southern states. It's not an accident that our first like 10 presidents were from, from Virginia because once you you totaled in there, there was a statistic, I don't remember, it was like 60% of the population of Virginia was enslaved people. So once you figured in this enslaved, this three-fifths compromise, they gained enormous power inside the Electoral College. So to flesh that out just a little bit more, they decided instead of a popular vote, the states will elect the president. The states can decide how to do that, but in deciding how much weight each state gets in the overall election, we're going to use population and congressional districts, and we're going to count population as one vote for people who can vote, and each enslaved person will count as three-fifths of a whole person. It's just the ugliest way that we could have started this whole thing, but it is how it started, and I don't think we can really understand how we got to where we are today without understanding that that's where all of this generated from. So, we have the first election where this is pretty irrelevant because everybody's on the same page, and you can go to the next slide, thank you, about George Washington. We're just, yes, thumbs up, George Washington. Everybody like the let's do it. Board. Second election, yep, let's do George Washington again, sounds good. And then it got a little bit messier. And this is where we're definitely just gonna lean really hard on Hamilton, I'm probably gonna sing. So, because we all know we have that they were using the runner-up, I just, sometimes I think about how would this have played out if we had continued this idea that we're going to use the runner-up as the vice president. What a truly bananas idea. But I do kind of wish we'd stuck with it. What if Donald Trump was president and Hillary Clinton was vice president? So you can just, you can channel the conflict that must have been present in this election in the if you had to choose, if you had to choose. That's the moment in Hamilton. I told y'all I was going to sing. And then, there were, and then Thomas Jefferson was like, I was there. We thought this idea up. I see now. It's truly terrible. So they have the 12th Amendment that says, okay, we're not going to do this anyway. That was a bad idea. You're going to vote for president and vice president at the same time. So you the next slide, and you'll see. So we get the 12th Amendment where we, we group these folks together. When all of this started, the working assumption was that lots of people would run for president and that parties would not really be a factor. Parties were not really a thing when the Electoral College was conceived. And so the idea was the states will decide, but probably you'll never get a clear winner in the Electoral College, and so it will go to Congress, and Congress will choose the president. And that's really what the framers were comfortable with. That's where they thought this whole thing was going. Um, and on that assumption, the, the winner and the runner-up being president and vice president makes a lot more sense. But that is not how things started to work out. Yeah, I think it was interesting. I think the hardest, I mean, listen, again, I love that soliloquy from Washington about factions and how we should really watch for that, and it was dangerous. But I think the, the area in which our founding fathers were perhaps the most short-sighted is parties, because they became powerful pretty quickly. And I think what you see in the evolution of not only our voting, but in the evolution of how we feel about the Electoral College is the changing roles of parties. I mean, we got popular votes because parties were basically, and we, what's really interesting, I think, is not just the popular votes, but we get secret ballots. I mean, they didn't used to be secret ballots. 
you would walk up, the party you wanted to participate with would hand you the ballot already with everybody on it, and you'd go turn it in. And everybody kind of knew who you voted for. They call it the Australian ballot. They wanted to bring in the secret balloting. And you see, I think, in the Electoral College and how we were exercising our issues with parties and the power parties have in our electoral system as these changes came about. So we move on, roll forward, you can go to the next slide, and we have the election of 1824, which was truly strange because there are several candidates. Andrew Jackson wins the popular vote. He wins the Electoral College, but he doesn't get to that magic number that you need to decide the election in the Electoral College. So it goes to Congress. And despite having won the Electoral College and the popular vote, Andrew Jackson does not become the president. Nobody liked Andrew Jackson. And, well, and he talks about this as the corrupt bargain that Henry Clay cut a deal with his opponent to become Secretary of State in exchange for rallying the troops in Congress to throw the election his way. And so this is part of where Andrew Jackson's raging populism comes from. Because if you'd had the experience of winning even the Electoral College and the popular vote, it would be difficult to let that go. I mean, I can have some grace for Andrew Jackson on this. I agree. Not on everything, but on this point. You can go to the next slide. So, Things are quite different now than they were when the Electoral College was conceived. They were different rapidly, mm -hmm. but they are very, very different today. And if you go to the next slide, we'll kind of tick through some of those major differences. So again, no political parties in 1787. And I think, I don't, you know, if I had a time machine, which I don't, I would love to go back and, and ask them, like, why did you think that we would evade this very popular reaction to politics, that this, these factions, this party politics, how did you think this was, it seemed like a, like a goal, but there was no real strategy in place to keep that from happening. And I think another huge important change is the role of media and the way that information spreads. I mean, I think part of the Electoral College was based on this very elitist idea that not everybody would be informed. I mean, that's still true. There are differing levels of information. But I mean, you gotta think, this was before the telegram, this was before, obviously, before television and internet and the flow of information so freely. And I think that they were um, protecting, in a, in a way, against this idea that not everybody would know or have the right information or be sort of the elite <coughs> that, I and mean, you definitely see that elitist, like, you don't really understand what's going on here with Andrew Jackson's election, but I think you see it with the founding fathers as well. It's almost like what the Founding Fathers were doing just couldn't scale very well, and they didn't realize that. So few people were really involved in creating this country relative to the number of people who lived here. Um, there's a book that Sarah always recommends so much that I started reading it, too. <laughs> these gave it. Is, these traits from Joe Lepore. It's, like, it's an excellent discussion of American history. And she talks in the book about how um, Thomas Jefferson, I think, was estimating that like maybe a third of people in the United States wanted to go to war with Britain and be independent. And maybe a third were British loyalists and there were a third who did not care. They were just trying to live their lives and you know, feed their families and stay alive. And you know, when you think about it in those terms, it still kind of shakes out that way. It still kind of <laughs> shakes out that way. And you realize, okay, if a third of the people cared about this at all, and then from that third, a much smaller group convened to make it happen. And then within that group, they're all jazzed about reading all these philosophers. They're really in love with their own thoughts about this thing, right? They want to get this right. They recognize that they're creating something new. And so they're constantly thinking about the Greeks and the Romans. And, you know, you can just imagine the group think that starts to form around a, a, a collection of people like this. And I think they just forgot, hey, like, people who are in this room are gonna be part of this process in some way, and they're not gonna be quoting Voltaire as they go <laughs> to the ballot box. And so there's gonna have to be another more effective way to reach them, and that's the, that's the opening of political parties. And like, if I'm giving grace, I think we needed that obsession. I remember the historian who, um, I can't remember her name, but she's a historian who sort of like, I mean, I guess you don't break a 200-year-old story, but really brought the relationship between Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings to light. 
and she talks about like the hypocrisy of that hey, he was writing all this, but she and like how he couldn't see clearly and he was engaged in his personal behavior. And she said that he was just obsessed with democracy. He was just obsessed with this experiment. And he couldn't think of anything else. And he couldn't see clearly almost anything outside of this experiment. And I mean, I think we needed that, right? I know that they didn't get everything right. I don't think they got the electoral college right. But I think the idea that there were these people who were just like, obsessed with getting this off the ground um, is awesome. And I think, I'm not sure it ever would have gotten off the ground without that, that level of obsession. So they didn't contemplate partisanship as a factor here in two significant ways. One was that they really thought the electors would exercise their individual discretion. <laughs> you know, the, the idea that electors would be bound by state law to award their votes to the winner of the popular vote was just not in the plan. And then the other thing that they assumed is that Congress would decide most of these elections anyway. And so the role of the electors is much bigger in our system today than the framers imagined, because again, we have those political parties preventing a multitude of candidates. It's never gonna go to Congress when you have two parties really controlling who gets nominated and, and funneled into this process. Well, and I mean, you see that in the lack of the direct election of senators too when they started. There was a lot of, you know, they were really leaning on the representative part of this democracy experiment, let's put it that way. Yeah. Let's not trust the masses. Mm -hmm. Let's just get some good qualified people in the room and let them figure things out. You can go to the next slide. So here's where we are today. Under state law, all but two states operate on a winner-take-all basis. You win the popular vote, you get the electors, and they are bound to vote for you. Electors are bound to, oh, you just said that part. And then the national parties limit the number of candidates so Congress doesn't decide. It's all those issues we just, started with. It's just a completely different universe than the Electoral College was invented for on lots of levels. So you can go to the next slide and we'll tell you we've been debating the Electoral College for a very long time. Sometimes it feels like this is a relatively recent discussion. There have been over 700 pieces of legislation introduced in Congress to get rid of the Electoral College. There have been more amendments um, proposing to alter the Electoral College than any other type of amendment offered to the Constitution. It hasn't happened yet, but it is not for lack of trying. Well, and I have a theory, I would like to be interested in what you think, but I feel like the, uh, because of our polarization, because of a lot of structural issues, um, the rapidity with which we are facing electoral college issues are increasing. I mean, I always like to cite the statistic. I am 38 years old. I have voted in five presidential elections. I have voted with the popular vote four times. I have seen my candidate serve twice. That sucks. Like, that's not a good feeling. We were talking at dinner. I I'm, I'm, would be interested to know the impact of all the people of my generation who their very first election was the 2000 election, which was, y'all are babies. The babies in the room don't remember this. It was bananas. We did not know who was president for like a while. Um, I'll never forget that Newsweek cover where it was like half Al Gore's face and half George Bush's face. Um, and for that to be your first presidential election, like I sometimes I'm like, why am I still interested in politics? Like it was very upsetting and disempowering and to have to face that again so soon is really frustrating. So the Electoral College has received a ton of criticism. Let's talk about a little bit why. Um, one, people just see it as archaic because so many assumptions underlying its creation have not proven to be true or lasting. Um, it's been called ambiguous because of things like Sarah described. There are times when it just doesn't produce a clear winner. Um, it is referred to as drastically undemocratic. We're going to talk more about that in a second, but you get the sense right out of the gate. If this thing was designed to not count all people, that's a problem. And then I think the reason this hasn't gotten fixed, despite over 700 tries, is because it is tied so closely to congressional districts. Mm -hmm. And when you start messing with congressional districts, you get right to questions about gerrymandering and about who sits in Congress and why they sit there and what could happen to the possibility of their reelection if you really dig into that those maps. And so. It's, a, it's kind of like you pull this thread and a whole lot of things could come apart if you start to really dig into the Electoral College. Yeah, when I was doing this research, I found out that the ACLU has opposed the Electoral College since 1968. So there's a little fun fact for the you. The American Bar Association oh, yeah, has true. criticized the Electoral College. I mean, that is a very, that's a surprising thing to hear. 
Well, and I really don't understand the idea that the the defense is always well. Then all these states will become pointless, as opposed to now when every state is so important because the electoral. I don't understand that sort of approach to the idea that oh well, it will really throw things out of balance as if every state participates equally because of the electoral college. So we go to the next slide. In the face of all this, like, what are the arguments for the Electoral College? I suppose this is where yeah, I'm going to leave back because I <laughs> So the people who argue from a modern standpoint for keeping the Electoral College say, one, it is important to preserving federalism. Two, it is important to ensuring that rural people have a voice in our system. There's a thought that without the Electoral College, New York and California decide our elections and a whole group of concerns throughout the rest of the country do not get represented in the process. There's the idea that the Electoral College theoretically should pull us toward the center because a candidate has to have appeal across the nation instead of just in major metropolitan areas. Um, <laughs> someone has made an argument, which I think is fascinating, that, like a scholar, a legitimate person has said, <laughs> um, we haven't had a bad president in 200 plus years, so it seems to be working. I was like, you wrote that on paper? <laughs> I don't know. That seems like a broad assertion to me. Um, but, you know, the basic idea is that we, we want to keep all of the states in a, in a position that matters to some extent. They're, like, they're never going to matter equally in terms of elections. But we have to figure out how this doesn't just concentrate around a few large cities in the country. I don't think the map always supports that argument, but I think it's interesting and I think it's worth grappling with. It's kind of like, why do we always start the primaries in Iowa and New Hampshire? You can have a whole lot of discussion about how those places do not reflect the rest of the country well, so they shouldn't go first. And then on the flip side, you can say, but that tradition has really vetted candidates more. They have to go do the retail politics. They have to meet with people. And I don't know what the right answer is, but I do think it's worth stepping back every now and then and saying, Does, is this still working for us? And the, the research indicates that overwhelmingly, Americans do not think the Electoral College is working for us. I don't understand this idea that states should elect the president. I also think it might be sort of based on an antiquated idea of states. Listen, I get real radical. You catch me at the right moment, I'm ready to dissolve state lines. I don't understand. I mean, listen, and I'm an eight, I've told three people today, I'm an eighth generation Kentuckian. I love being a Kentuckian. My state identity is very important to me. And also, I've lived in like four states. Who in this room has only lived in a single state? Okay, the babies, not surprising. Um, but like, I just think that the idea that like we, you, everybody crosses state lines constantly. And I mean, I think I would almost be more on board with some sort of regional approach. I love that map that talks about how the United States is basically like five regions and talks about the history and why they, these regions break out the way they do. But I'm just, am I missing something about why even originally they thought it was important for state states to elect a president as opposed to individuals? Just the elitism? No, I mean, I think there, I think it's about self-governance. I think it's the idea that we can govern ourselves more effectively in smaller locations. You know, that, that this idea that the federal government is only supposed to do this small number of things, everything else is left to the state because the state should be more responsive to its constituents. It should have a better understanding of the geography, which does matter in a lot of policy decisions. Um, this is another condition that has changed, though. The federal government does a lot more today than I think the Founding Fathers ever would have imagined. We can argue about the wisdom of that, but it's just true. We have a much larger federal apparatus than I think was intended. Um, and I just had a thought that left my brain. It was, a, like, an, it was a good thought about states. No, 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 here's the other thing that's changed a lot. I got it back. The, what the president represents is completely different than what they had in mind, I think. You know, the, with the expansion of federal power has come this sprawling executive branch. It's a different job today than it was then. Now, whether that counsels in favor of states being more or less involved, I don't know. But it is a really big shift from when this whole system was imagined. We hold the president up as something much more powerful 
than I think the framers intended us to. Yeah, I mean, I think it would blow their mind that that's like the only election most people ever pay attention to. I think the idea that people are totally unplugged from their local elections and only really care about this national race would be very foreign to them. It has a lot to do with television. When State of the Union addresses started being televised, it really changed how we understand what the presidency is about. And I just personally am in favor of a president saying, opt out, I'm gonna send my written report to Congress, let's roll some of this back, because I think we saddle this office with way too much. Did you know that there was the famous Kennedy, this is just a random television fact, what I think I learned in these tricks, that you had the television debate between Nixon and Kennedy that everybody knows about, right? The one where Nixon was sweating and Kennedy looked real good, and they, they point to that as one of being a part of his success. And then they didn't have another one for like 15 years. Which I always think is so interesting. Why do we stop doing them? And why do we start again? Maybe we should have kept on with that whole thing, the televised debate. But you can go to the next slide. I mean, this is a big question. Like, where does democracy live? Does democracy thrive most when you look at the entirety of the map? Is it more in local communities, in those congressional districts? Um, and this is a huge criticism of the Electoral College. Yeah, and I mean, I think the impact, particularly on civil rights and particular groups cannot be ignored. I mean, the, the idea that we live by this idea of one person, one vote, again, this would have been very foreign to the founding fathers. This is definitely not what they were building the system on. This came about from a Supreme Court decision, but I think it is something that we value as Americans. And I think when you hear people get upset about the Electoral College, this is what you're hearing. It's not one person, one vote. I mean, a voter in Wyoming has over three times as much influence on the presidential election as a voter in a more densely populated California. Their votes count for more. And what you see this play out, particularly with minority groups, is like Asian Americans have barely more than half the voting power of white Americans because they tend to live in safe states. And so you have this really, really hard to defend impact on people's civil rights, particular groups. And if you click to the next section, because when we're looking at the Electoral College, we're depending on the census, and you can click again, and the census undercounts minorities. The census itself admits that it's under, the Census Bureau itself calculated that the 2010 census missed 1.5 million minorities, and that's not counting any marginalization that comes from voter suppression. And so we have a really big problem when we look at the impact of the Electoral College on groups like that, on minority groups. Yeah, and I think that an a unintended consequence of this whole thing is that we have really grouped into safe states and swing states, and what the Electoral College does is massively overvalue those swing states. Ohio, Florida, you know, Pennsylvania, like those swing states get way too much attention and too much money in a way that no one can characterize as democratic. It's kind of like what happens with Iowa and New Hampshire. If there's nothing fair about those two states having a monopoly on the primaries. Florida does not deserve our trust. They mess it up every time. <laughs> I just wanna say that. While we're all sitting up here in the snow, we can bust on Florida. So lots of problems. You feel like there has to be a better way. And you can go through your two slides as we get into that. So there are a bunch of ideas out there about what a better way could look like. And the one that Sarah and I often coalesce around is this national interstate, national popular vote interstate compact. And so what this is, is every state passes legislation to join the compact. And the compact says when enough states have joined this electoral popular vote compact to reach 270 electoral votes, we pledge our vote, electoral votes will always go to the popular vote winner. I think the number is obviously 270, that that's what they're trying to get at, and I think right now they're at like 230-something. They're real close. Uh, they would have been even closer if said Nevada's governor vetoed it, which is unacceptable. Um, and so I think, I, I think we like this. I like it just because it gets rid of the Electoral College, and I'm in favor of anything that gets rid of the Electoral College. She likes it because it puts that power in the hands of the state, and so the states are still choosing to participate in the compact and taking a legislative process to sort of take that initiative and change the way they participate. Small problem, it's possible this isn't constitutional. Um, <laughs> how is that possible? If it's okay for them to do winner take all, wouldn't this, why wouldn't this be okay? You would think, but there are people who say that this is in effect 
the states acting in concert to abolish the Electoral College, which is enshrined in the Constitution today, and that that has to be done through an amendment process instead of through this kind of workaround. I think it's worth testing that theory, but I do like that states would be, would be voluntarily participating in this. I think it's important for the country that we do more things by consensus, and I think if the Electoral College got abolished on like a party line, kind of cram down situation, which would be difficult because amending the Constitution is very hard. But I, I think this is a good way for states to decide, hey, we care about our neighbors, we're gonna work together. Now, criticism of this, maybe you start to feel like my vote doesn't count if you live in a state that's decided to go with the national popular vote. You know, it, it could make people feel less empowered in the process. I but don't understand that your it, vote will still compose the national popular vote. Yeah, and it's just, I mean, most people when they say I want my vote to count mean I want my vote to be dispositive, right? I want my vote to count means I want my person to win. And it's just not ever gonna be like that here in the United States. We gotta give a little to each other. So I think trying a new system, um, we don't run the risk too much of it being less democratic than what we have going now. So if we get this compact to pass, but then they find it unconstitutional, then would you be okay with an amendment? Yeah. Okay, good. Just making sure. Just I, think so. I want to run this out. Make sure I'm still okay. <laughs> really important when I think about it. <laughs> All right, let's go to the next slide. There are some other ideas, and there are some ideas that could work in concert with something like the National Interstate Popular Vote. So, one idea that's been tossed around is to do a wholesale redistribution of electors. Instead of basing it on congressional districts, maybe we base it on something else. There are lots of ways to do this. Or we could wrap it up with my reapportionment of Congress and do everything at the same time. I have a plan. Um, this was in our one of our other talks. I'm just going to give it to y'all for free. Um, I want to reapportion Congress so we have 6,000 House of Representative members. Don't freak out. It'll be fine. Um, because we have too many constituents per representative. The Founding Fathers envisioned like about a 50,000 person to representative ratio. We're creeping up on like a million per representative ratio. That is not working now and it's no, certainly not going to work for much longer. So I just think we could do both at the same time. So another idea is a national bonus plan that you would do what we do now, but then the winner of the popular vote nationally would get a certain number of automatic electoral college votes. I like this one. I like this so one. So there's, there's like credit for being the popular vote winner in the electoral college. Um, and then the third thing, which could work harmoniously with any of these plans and could also maybe just on its own improve the electoral college is ranked choice voting. Are y'all familiar with ranked choice voting? So this idea that you would write down your, your first choice, second choice, third choice, and then we would go through multiple ballots and ranked choice voting just consistently produces um, more centrist candidates because we do have to kind of coalesce around people. Um, it improves turnout in the states where it's been tried um, lots of municipalities are doing ranked choice voting, and it does tend to ratchet down sort of the nastiness in races, too, because as a candidate, you've got to appeal to more than just your base. Um, the, who is the second choice for lots of people matters a ton in ranked choice voting. So lots of good, healthy things could happen in our system if we adopted ranked choice voting. Iowa caucus is basically ranked choice voting, because they like get in a room, and if your person doesn't get enough, 15%, then you got to pick somebody else. And so like the popular consensus is Barack Obama won because he was most people's second choice. Because once your first choice kind of falls out, you're gonna find somewhere else to go. Because we all know they're like in a room basically trying to convince each other. It's like every extrovert's fantasy and every introvert's worst nightmare. So we're probably obvious about where we are. Sarah's already disclosed her bias that she would get rid of the Electoral College. I, I think it is problematic. I think it is not as problematic as sometimes it is made out to be. I'm not sure the results would be totally different under a different system, but it's fun to game out those possibilities. And I am for adjusting to modern realities. You know, I wish we didn't have two dominant political parties, so I would like ranked choice voting to come in to make space for other parties. Um, I wish that we did a better job representing all of the communities in the United States, so let's try some things and see what helps. I am all for anything that gets us to the problem of gerrymandering, so I'm ready to like dip, dive into those numbers and dig deep on those congressional districts and try to figure out what's going on. But 
we don't know, you know, what the next steps will be here. We've talked a lot in other, in other um, events like this about a constitutional convention. There's a big movement out there to like get everybody in a room again and think through some new amendments. I just think we need to shake things up. I'm ready for more representatives. I'm ready to amend the constitution. I'm not even picky about what it is. I just think we need to mix it up. Um, we've gotten almost every constitutional amendment by threatening the constitutional convention. We get so close, the Congress is like, oh, I don't want to put the whole Constitution on the table. Okay, fine, you can have this amendment. Literally, you would be shocked if you went back and realized how often this happened. Um, our last amendment we got, because I'm not making this up, somebody got a bad grade on a paper. Um, there was like a half-ratified constitutional amendment hanging out there. He pointed out in a paper, he got a C, and he was so upset about this. He like went out there, showed everyone it was half-ratified, got it ratified, and that's the 27th Amendment. Is that, that's the last one. And I just don't think that's where we should wrap up our work on the Constitution is because some dude in Texas got a bad grade. Um, it's about how, like, they can't get themselves a raise in Congress, basically. So I just think there's lots of things that the Electoral College, apportionment, gerrymandering, there's just so many places where we've stalled and they're not working anymore. And because we're so polarized, because Congress has abdicated a lot of this responsibility, we're not, we're not, we don't have any forward momentum. We don't have any movement. And I don't think if you see, if people don't see that things can change that we can see a system's not working and improve it they just fall out of the process and for better or for worse the presidential election the president he or herself it's just everybody's focus it's just when you say the government i feel like it's just the first thing that comes to people's minds and i don't think that's awesome i don't think that's accurate but i do think that is reality and i think dealing with the way in which the the process in which people most commonly interact with and making it more democratic and changing it, there will be unintended consequences, absolutely. I think, you know, the Iowa caucus and the New Hampshire primary came because we wanted all this transparency in the primary system after the 1968 convention, and it turned out in lots of ways I did not expect. I'm sure that will happen if we make changes to the Electoral College. And I'm just not, I'm, I'm so unhappy with where we, at, we are now, I'm willing to risk it, basically. I think it could be much easier to do this now because no one is out there really banging the drum for federalism anymore. We argue federalism in both parties when it's convenient for us and we throw it out the window when it's not. You know, um, legalization of marijuana is a good example of that. Um, if the Republican Party were really about federalism, you'd have a lot more movement within the Republican Party to decriminalize marijuana on the national level so that states could decide what they want to do. Instead, we have this ridiculous stalemate where you're still breaking federal law when you purchase weed in Colorado, even though it's totally legal there. If you own a marijuana dispensary, where are you going to have your bank account without risking federal violations? That's a ridiculous place to be. Um, but because of sort of the social issues around that, the Republican Party can't take that up. Similarly, you know, Democrats get very federalist when it comes to sanctuary cities, this idea that a location should be able to determine how they want to use their police resources as it, as it relates to immigration violations. And so that's when we see Democrats really excited about states, but not when it comes to things like health care. So it's, we really take this issue by issue. We do this on all kinds of principles underlying our government, but you especially see it around federalism. So I don't know who would be really standing up excited about maintaining the power of the states in national elections. I think it would just depend on the, demogra the demographics of the country at the particular time and the way things are trending. I don't know, I still think people get it. My, my own father got very defensive with me because my 10 year old, I'm not kidding. I've asked him what he, 10 things he learned in his 10 years of life and one of his things was the electoral college is garbage. I'm like being indoctrinated him slightly. And my dad was so offended, he was like, well, then our votes won't count. I'm like, you live in California. Like, your vote doesn't count now. Like, I don't understand, again, that whole approach. But I think there are people, because it's become a partisan issue, um, who really want to fly the flag of defending the Electoral College. But. but if it became a partisan issue in the opposite direction, that would just, I think that would change. I don't think, yeah. I don't think we are committed to federalism on any kind of principled basis. Yeah at all right now, and maybe that's because it doesn't get tested in ideologically consistent ways, but again, this partisanship is the problem. This is why I'm saying ranked choice voting everybody is really important, because we've got to break through this two-party stalemate. So that's what we wanted to share with you. If you roll to the next slide, you'll see that we um, are ready now to chat with you, and do, how are we doing that? Do you want me to just hand you a microphone? Oh, 
you've got it, perfect. You know, no pressure, but we always get incredibly thoughtful comments from the audience. Who wants to be first? Thank you. So you mentioned a lot about how, like, um, um, about how parties are detrimental to the government and how the government moves. Uh, do you think that the government would be able to push through, like Congress especially, would be able to push through policy in the way that they are now without it being partisan? Because I think a big part of the benefit of having a partisan system is that it helps to push through policy. Do you see that being affected if, if in like an imaginary world the parties weren't as influential? So I think we have all the crappy parts of partisanship and none of the good parts. I think we stripped the actual parties of their power while increasing partisanship. Um, I'm really coming around in the smoke-filled room. I think we should bring those back. I think you don't see, the, the book I was talking, like, I've talked a lot today, I don't remember where I mentioned politics is for power, but it's a really great book. And he talks about like, you know, we all think the idea of a party boss was so awful and offensive. But what party bosses did, they did lots of corrupt, awful things, no doubt about it. But a lot of what they did was localize politics. So they would get you a trash can if they needed it, and they would help you get zoning if you needed it, and they would do the political work, and you would give them your loyalty, and they would tell you who to vote for, okay? So there was, there was a power exchange between these partisan par party bosses or the party officials, and that's where the partisanship flowed from. There was something for you to look to as opposed to just emotions, values, whatever you want to call it that fuels our partisanship now. And because they pulled in all that power from passing out stuff, then they had capital to pick nominees and to say this person's not gonna work or this person will work. And they, they exercised that power in truly racist, sexist, terrible ways. I'm not arguing that part. But the idea that you had people who were actually in that power flow, understood what people needed. Like he, he um, profiles this guy, I think it's in Minnesota. Um, and he was kind of like, he's like a party boss. Like it's this um, first generation immigrant guy who helps all these immigrants in his neighborhood figure out how to like apply for this or help the trash, comply, all these things. And then he has influence with nominees and he tells people like, okay, this guy's good, but we're gonna vote for him. It's like an old fashioned way this used to work. And you know, you see that with parties in Europe. They're very powerful as far as picking the nominees and making sure there's consistency. And it's really more about what is this party doing for me so that I can, there's a power exchange between the party itself and the people so that then they trust their nominees. But now the party is all the nominee. Like it's not, it's not what is the party doing for me. It's about the personality of the nominee. And you truly see that with Trump. I mean, the party has transformed since he became the nominee. And so I just think, I don't think parties are bad. I just think we've stripped them of all real power to pick nominees, to really serve the people in their membership, as opposed to just like being a mascot. You know, I just think that, I think that's the problem. It's a marketing apparatus yeah. more than anything else right now. I think we get more and better legislation. And I think the data bears that out. If you look over time at the number of substantive laws passed in Congress, it's just taking a nosedive. I mean, our Senate practically exists now to confirm judges and not much else. We, when we had legislators exercising independent judgment, and there are some really great graphics where you can see over time how many bills were passed with bipartisan support and watching all that overlap evaporate as time rolls forward, it, it coincides with doing less legislative business. So I think that's an, I, I, I would love for the parties to play that role of really pushing through good policy. They're formulating it and then they're out there selling it to the American people and they're not delivering it because they don't actually work together once they're in the seats. And you, and you don't have any legislators defecting in helpful ways to get things done. You know, I guess we can all feel excited when things go down 53, 47 on principle, 
but that's not really getting the, the work of the American people done. And, and to me, what's the point of this whole thing if they're not actually getting the work done? Well, and it just becomes about like, it's not just, a, you know, control never stays with one party for very long. I mean, used to you would have 50 years of Democratic control of Congress, 40 years of Republican control of Congress. It wasn't flipping every other election cycle. Um, and therefore there was more, moderates had more power, people who'd served long had more institutional power. They changed a lot of the rules to, with like committee membership, which they're thinking about them doing, you can serve for so long. They just stripped all the institutional, partisan power out of a lot of this, so it became just who could be a bigger ideologue so you don't get primaried because that's your actual concern is being primary, not actually delivering for your constituents. And when they were flip, when they're flipping so constantly, the power of the party control is flipping. One of the best um, political scientists I heard, she was studying like, when it flips so much, their timeline shrinks. So when you're just worried about the next election because then you could be in the minority, you're not thinking about long-term problems like climate change. You're thinking about something that you can parrot and broadcast in the next election because you were worried about a primary challenge or you're the one of like 30 people who are actually in a swing district out of 435 and you're worried about just getting anything short that you can get achieved so that you can push that because you the next election is ride or die because control could switch to the other party. And why does it flip so much? I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that it's mostly about individual personalities. And we get bored of people, or we get bored of a certain style, and we think, well, let's shake this up, let's try something new. It's really not about philosophy for the most part, you know? And so I just think you see so many negative effects. The parties should exist as shorthand for expressing some guiding principles. We should not expect people just who are working really hard to pay the bills, get the laundry done, get the kids to school, deal with the broken down car, to know the ins and outs of a trade agreement with Southeast Asia. That's too much to ask. So you should be able to rely on a party generally to express some guiding lights for you as we transact that sort of business in the world. I just don't think the parties are doing that anymore. Well, and I think really the Electoral College is a stand in for the debate about whether or not our representatives should be truly representative of the majority view of the popular sentiment of their constituents, or if they are more of a trustee, doing what they see as best from their level of expertise. And for better or for worse, and I think there's a lot of reasons for this, Americans don't want a trustee. But I mean, it's like they want us to just poll us on our, let's text me a poll and we'll all tell you what to do. I felt this when I was a city commissioner. There was no like, we'll give you the benefit of the doubt and trust you to make the right choice for us. It was, you better do what the most people with the loudest voice tell you to do because that's what you are there to do. You're there to fill in and do what we want you to do. I was reading an article this morning about a swing district in Iowa. And they, this was, I mean, these are the people that like went for Obama and went for Trump who truly blow my mind. As, like a, as a party rat and a political rat, I just, it blows my mind. And what they said is, well, we just want somebody new. We basically just want somebody new, like this outsider mentality every time. And I just want to be like, say that out loud. Does that sound like a great idea? Every time to just start fresh with somebody who doesn't have any clue what's going on and has not participated in the system in any long-term way beforehand. Like I can get, I guess I get the appeal and I understand why that would be more likely to appeal in a system where people distrust the government, which is a huge problem. Um, but just to hear someone articulate it like that, I'm like, whew, that's, that's a lot to take in. And that's why you see nominees that are new to people. They're new to the field. That's what people like. They like fresh face. And the parties feel that, you know, because so many votes are taken just to cut ads against a candidate on the other side. We know this isn't going to pass, but we're going to make them vote. So they go on record so that we can cut an ad about it and maybe get that seat in the next election. That's a, that's a sad place for us to be. On that uplifting note. I do have a question that kind of piggies over here, sorry, piggybacks <laughs> off of that. So in your book, one of the chapters that really kind of stood out to me talked about how people really view party politics as a sports team. And your whole chapter was basically explaining you have to take off your jersey and have those conversations. So 
So, which I think is a very dangerous line to be viewing this as a sports team. Um, so how would you, I guess, advise us to, to move past that, to have those conversations without having that sports team mindset? I mean, I think the best exercises that, like for me personally, that we've done on the White House, on the White House, before it's lit, we should be in the White House, we would do such a good job, um, on the podcast, is having to really learn the history of an issue and being able to articulate why I support that issue. Um, because when you have to do that, you can't just lean on the talking points. You have to really be able to articulate. And so much of you know, that sort of team sport partisanship is just knowing, like, just knowing what you're supposed to pair it. Um, knowing what, how you're supposed to feel about this particular issue. Not really knowing why, but definitely knowing. And like, if, especially, in, I would, I, I feel confident 100% of the time, whatever the issue is, if you go further, far enough back in history, you will be shocked. If you're an environmentalist, did you know Richard Nixon started the EPA? That's pretty crazy, right? Like, there, you go back far enough, you're going to be like, wait, what? Like, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm in the upside down. What happened? Like, it's inevitable in every issue that you find that. Um, that the Southern Baptist Convention supported Roe v. Wade when it first came out. Hello, what? Um, like just all kinds of things like that that are gonna that what you, you need that sort of disequilibrium. I think that's really, really helpful because no party has a mon monopoly on rightness, you know, and no person does either. And so when you can have to explain it, or when you can really dig deep into the history and you find those moments where you feel like you're a little bit in the upside down, I just think it's really good for everybody. It's also nice, like, as an initial matter, just within your families or your sort of spheres of influence, to talk about issues that people don't know a whole lot about and see where everybody lands. We, before Andrew Yang, we did this all the time with universal basic income. We would, we would roll into a college campus and say, let's chat about universal basic income, and nobody would have heard of it. And so we don't have a default. Thanks for ruining that, that for us, Andrew Yang. No. I'm, like, happy that it's getting more oxygen and also a little sad. Um, <laughs> Because there's kind of a great libertarian case for universal basic income as opposed to what we do today in social um, support systems. And so it's fun to be able to flesh out those arguments and talk about them a little bit differently. Um, I think that's why criminal justice reform actually succeeded on a bipartisan basis because there are lots of different factors that can go into you feeling that the criminal justice system is not doing justice today. And you can bring multiple constituents together, even if it's for different reasons, who cares? Like if we're making progress, take the win and do it. We are doing it very incrementally on a federal level. I would love to see that happen a lot faster, but that's okay because we're getting there and we're getting there in a way that's sustainable and that could have some momentum. So I think the more we're able to, like let's stop talking about the same tired fights for a second and practice this jersey removal in spaces where we don't go very often, then we can build the muscles to do it on some of the hot button issues. I think you also just get in places where certain issues reach a critical mass and just for, for their own impact on individual lives, the party talk, politics just sort of fall away. I think you see that with the opioid crisis. I think we're like, two years from being that way with climate change, where it's just gonna be to a point where everybody's like, all right, well, this is terrible, so we gotta do something. Um, and I think you see it in a lot of spaces where it just, it reaches a fever pitch. I mean, I, it's shocking to me how much conversations move in this country and how quickly, but, I mean, it, it, this is a not a unique take, but the Democratic Party and the way they talk about things, so, I mean, it's moved so far to the left just from 2016. I don't say that as a bad thing. I know a lot of people feel that. But, you know, I think that there are conversations that I feel like we've been having over and over again and to feel some movement and to feel like, oh, no, now it's okay to say this openly and everybody says it and everybody advocates for this position. Because, you know, there's polarization. I don't know if polarization is the right word. There's sort of a, a partisanship and intensity within the parties, too, that I think needs to be shaking loose a little bit. And so I think, you know, the world is changing and the world is changing quickly. And so that's going to have an effect on all these positions. And that, we, you know, we talk about them, that in the book. The problem with those positions is it freezes us all in time. You know, we're arguing about welfare as if 
the way we work hasn't changed. And we're arguing about um, healthcare when there's been so much impact of technology on how we care for people. Or we have an aging population as if that doesn't change every healthcare issue. And just all these things, it just freezes us. And I feel like so often, you know, sometimes we're having the same conversation that would have been happening in 1981, and the world's a little different since 1981. So, and I mean, sometimes just inevitability influences this. Like, you think about the Affordable Care Act. I would not have voted if I were a senator or representative for the Affordable Care Act when it was introduced. I have some major problems with what's in that law, but we did it, and now I feel like we have it. We made this decision as a country. The, the idea is how do we improve on this? How do we stabilize it? How do we make it work? So sometimes in a, in a democratic society, you gotta accept that you're not the only person who lives here. And I think that's a big problem with our elections. We keep fighting those old, old battles because we've gotten used to arguing about them. The country has broadly moved to be in support of the Affordable Care Act, it just has. Um, and so what's that new reality? What's the new conversation? And, and I think that in a way, healthcare is one of those issues where everyone has, it's gotten bad enough that people say, okay, maybe I have a different idea about how to fix it than you do, but we do need to do something because this is not working for enough people. Um, so you've talked before about uh, electoral reform and the gerrymandering. Where do you think campaign finance laws come into this? Because I've seen a study before that says due to campaign finance laws in this country, we kind of operate more as an oligarchy than a democracy. I mean, I'm okay with that constitutional amendment too. I'm really open to any and all constitutional amendments. In fact, we can start with overturning Citizens United because I think it's a travesty. Um, and honestly, I think there's a lot of reforms that would, would, that would get to that problem. Like I think a big problem with the apportionment of Congress and the fact that people have to talk to try to, try to talk to one million constituents during a campaign makes campaigns more expensive. If you had to talk to fewer people in my city commission race, I didn't have to raise as much money. I didn't run TV ads. I knocked on doors because I could because there were only 5,000 doors, which is a lot of doors, but still it's doable, you know? So I think that gerrymandering, apportionment, there's a lot of ways to try to chip away at the campaign finance without overturning Citizens United, but I do think that would be an excellent place to start. I see this differently. Um, I, I'm not disputing that often we operate more like an oligarchy, and I think there are a lot of reasons for that, but I think there will always be a currency. Even if you take money out of it, there will be another currency. I think the new currency is attention. Donald Trump is not the president because he raised a bunch of money, he didn't. He's the president because he captivated everyone's attention in a way that no one's money could compete with, no matter how hard people tried. And so to me, this conversation is kind of like fighting the old war instead of looking ahead at the new one. Um, my feeling about campaign finance is mostly that disclosure is necessary. I would like to, to get rid of these dark money organizations I don't think it's right for dollars to end up in the hands of candidates that the public can't trace directly to an individual name. So I would like to see some reform around that, but I think the idea that people are just buying elections, now look, Michael Bloomberg could win the Democratic nomination and I could be proven wrong, right? This ability to just spend unlimited amounts of your own money, but Citizens United probably, overturning Citizens United probably doesn't get to that problem either. Right, there, there is always going to be a way, if you can control media, you are going to have an unfair advantage. And that's being done brilliantly by people like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, just as much as it's been done on the right. So, you know, I don't know how we regulate our way into what feels like fair elections in the attention economy, but I think that's where we are today. To the conversation with the Electoral College, um, a lot of the states that exist now, the ones that just have three votes, you know, a senator, well, no, two senators and one rep, a lot of them, <coughs> sorry, a lot of them were founded um, kind of like just, you know, on spike, you know, 
you know, I want to give slave states a couple more votes. So I'll just make this state because, you know, there are a couple people living here. So we can make a little state there. Um, and, you know, I always wonder why there are two Dakotas because no one barely lives there. You're not the there. only one. Um, <laughs> no one really lives there. Um, I mean, so, I think the people of South Dakota would argue with you, know, but yeah. As my ex said, Montana doesn't exist. She said that's a myth. Um, <laughs> so, and that's the case with a lot of the states in the middle of it. Um, uh, a lot of them were founded not necessarily because you know the population grew, but because you know they were just trying to get more votes in Congress and stuff. Um, so, what do you what do you think of the existence of? I don't want to say waste states. <laughs> I'm afraid of offending someone, but the existence of these sort of like more um, what do you call them like? Fights, see, it's kind of like that exists more because of politics than you know just necessity. I'm more inclined to split up the bigger ones than I am to condense the smaller ones. Um, I love the plan to split up Texas, and I like this plan to split up California too. Um, I really think especially with the apportionment of Congress, like this is gonna come to a head. Like because we're only divvying out this 435, if the population trends continue, how are we possibly gonna justify even like one representative to South Dakota when everybody else maybe is maybe legitimately growing or staying the same, but having to give up representatives to California? Like that's basically where Michigan is, I think, this pro what they're anticipating with the next census is. They didn't shrink. But we got to get more in California because we only have so many to pass out. Like, it's stupid math. It's a dumb way to do it. Um, but I thought there was a point in time where they were discussing merging the Dakotas. Did I make that up? I might have made that up. Um, I feel like that bubbles up around every once in a while. But I think a, a more likely scenario is that some of the bigger states split up. But, I, again, I also kind of want to tell them – hey, you guys, you know, you have a way disproportionate share of the power in the Senate. Shouldn't that be good enough? Like, why get greedy? Why do you need double the power in the Electoral College and the Senate than people who live in other states? Seems unfair to me. I think it is critically important to acknowledge the history of where everything in our country comes from in a much more realistic way. So I think that's the first step toward doing anything real and meaningful to make our society better. Um, I also think it's important to have a little bit of fluidity around maps. So I live right on the border of Kentucky and Ohio. Um, when I was working in a law firm, I drove across the bridge from Kentucky into Ohio twice a day, every day. The bridge that I drove across is falling apart. Okay, every day I was convinced today is the day I'm going to die on this bridge. It is falling apart because the bridge is really no one's problem because it crosses into two states and neither state wants to be the sucker that pays for bringing that bridge up to modern standards. And the federal government doesn't wanna do it because we can't get enough cooperation among the delegations of the states to make it a priority. It's in the news constantly. What are we gonna do about the Brent Spence Bridge? I don't know, probably some schmuck like me is gonna to have to die on it before we pay attention to it because it sits on a state line. So I certainly don't think that we've got all this figured out. Um, if Kentucky were to be dissolved in a bunch of different directions, would most of the state be better off? Would, would we be economically better off in northern Kentucky as part of Ohio? Probably. Would Sarah's part of Kentucky be better off as part of Missouri? Perhaps. You know, so I think there's a, there is some arguments to be made for rethinking all of this. Fundamentally, I am a defender of the apportionment of senators as two per state for this reason. I think Puerto Rico would have looked a lot different if they had had two members of the United States Senate. I think there is something important about if we're gonna to hang together as a country, being willing sometimes to sacrifice to places that are less populated or places that have more geographic challenges. I think climate change is going to change our perception of this entire thing. We're all gonna to wanna to go to those Dakotas soon. That's what I was gonna say. I mean, if we are going to see some movement and a lot of shifting around the middle of the country, I believe, because 
the weather is going to force it. Um, and so I just think the best thing we can do is sort of hold on loosely to our existing map, um, but maintain what I think works about the system as it is today, despite its horrific origins, is maintaining some sense that it is not all pure math. If we're gonna be a country together, we are occasionally gonna allocate resources in places where it doesn't make good sense just because we care about our neighbors. And I think that having two votes per state in the Senate um, forces us occasionally to do that. Yeah, I mean, Kentucky is a big, long state. I have so much more in common with the people of Southern Illinois and Southern Missouri and Western Tennessee than I do with Eastern Kentucky. Eastern Kentucky is nothing like where I live. And the people of Southern Illinois have a million more things in common with me than they do with Chicago. You know, like it's just, in some of this ways, it's like we're, it's inefficient. Like it just doesn't make sense that we're all trying to draw together these two really, really different groups to solve problems when these two groups have everything in common and could solve their problems together. Um, so I think that's true when you see some of those waste states too. Like in some ways, it, the, North Dakota and South Dakota could get a lot more done and they were just one Dakota. Although they would lose two senators, that, that would hurt. Um, but I think that, you know, a more regional approach based on actual shared resources, population, demographics, makes so much more sense. But it's hard because we're living in this era when people really struggle to anchor their identity in many places. And so if we were to redraw the United States, it would be one more form of identity being taken away, um, especially in places where there aren't a lot of other options for that. So we've got to, I think, rebuild some other institutions before we start making some of these changes to help folks find healthy expressions, healthy groups to be part of, healthy things to express pride about. Um, it's, I mean, it I'll tell you all right now, Texas will bail before they let go of that identity. We spent a lot of time in Texas recently. They take really it really Texas. serious. They love being Texans. They will straight up leave the union if we try to split their state up. And look, I think that's a thing that can happen too. I, I think in my lifetime, we will see secession movements, um, especially if we stay with the Electoral College. And we, I just, you know, we just gotta hold it all loosely because I, I think we are gonna see a lot of shifting and, and maybe it's time for that. We've done, we've had a really good run. I would like things, I would like to stay in union with all of the people who are in the United States right now. Um, and I hope that we will. And I do think we're gonna have to make some compromises to each other to do that. Um, and if not, you know, I just have to look at history to be the guide that some really wonderful things in history have happened when maps have changed and when people have governed themselves differently. I just wanna say that we started with me being like, I hate the Electoral College, and Beth being like, mm, probably won't say the United States of America. So that was some serious revolutionary uh, talk. I bet y'all weren't prepared for that when you came in. Those are some serious bookends. Yeah, great, let's give it up. For that. <laughs> <laughs> Brady's like, we're not inviting all that, okay. And um, if you want to stick around and get your book signed, that'd be wonderful. I'm sure they would love to do that for us. Happily. Yeah. Thank you guys so much. Thanks so much for your time tonight.